appreciate this time. I appreciate it. We know cheese is bad for us. Why is it that we have a hard time giving it up? <laughs> My favorite question. <laughs> okay. Thank you for asking that. You know, it, it really is true when we do research studies and we put people on completely vegan diets, they do great. They lose weight, and their diabetes gets better and everything. But so many of them will say, the one food I just really miss is cheese. And I thought, why is that? It smells like old socks. Why do people want cheese? <laughs> and I really think there are three reasons why we get hooked on cheese. Um, the first is that it's salty. And you know how we like salty snacks? And it's also very fatty. It's about 70% fat. And potato chips and french fries and onion rings and fatty, salty snacks just get us hooked. But the third thing, beyond the salt and beyond the oiling of it, is uh, the presence of opiate chemicals called casomorphins. The, the casein protein, C-A-S-E-I-N, the casein protein in cheese, uh, as it ingests, release, releases mild narcotic chemicals, mild opiates, that go to the brain and attach to the same receptors that heroin attaches to, and they just get you hooked. They, don't get me wrong, they're not as strong as heroin. Uh, the strongest of the casomorphins has about one-tenth the brain binding power compared to pure pharmacy grade morphine. So it's, it's not strong enough to get you arrested, but it's just strong enough to make you really want to have that Belvita no matter what it does to your waistline. Thank you very much. Who's ready next? We have had some questions about um, organic dairy foods or, or dairy that has been raised without the hormones. Is there anything that's any better about that? I assume it still has the casein, but is, would it be better for anybody without the hormones? Um, yeah, it would be better for, for one uh, person, if I can say that, and that is the calf. <laughs> the, the, the calf's mom shouldn't be injected with hormones, but uh, that's it. Um, when it comes to you, um, keep in mind you are not a calf. Um, cow's milk was not made for you. And also, there is no such thing as hormone-free milk. Uh -huh. um, and as a matter of fact, a lot of the dairy companies that aren't injecting hormones said, can't we label our milk hormone-free? And the government says, no, you can't, because cow's milk always has hormones, because the cows are pregnant. Pregnant cows make a lot of hormones that get into the milk. So you could be getting organic milk from the happiest cow in the world, supposedly, to find such a thing. Um, and they're filled with hormones, um, no matter what the source, uh, because the cows make estrogens and they get into the blood, the blood plasma and then are concentrated into the in the milk. And, and as you probably know, it's um, women previously diagnosed with breast cancer who have the most high-fat dairy. I talk about cheese and butter have a much higher risk of dying of their cancer compared to women who avoid dairy. And men who consume the most cheese have more infertility. Um, I'm talking about low sperm counts and so forth. <laughs> so what we think is happening is that the hormones in cheese that have nothing to do with the hormones that are added, they're just made by the cow, um, that those are probably enough to affect human biology. That makes sense when you think of it that way. Yeah. Yeah. Can we have somebody yeah. else with a question? Sure. Good Hi. Hi. Good afternoon, sir. I don't have Hi. a question per se, but I would like to thank you very much for your studies on the dairy and cheese. Uh, first meeting I came to at Nanette's suggestion three years ago. Um, I was upset stomach-wise. I had had a, a colon resection already, osteoporosis, dairy, 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 but I was renting it, you know, in, out, gone. I felt horrible. Came here and they said, you know, one of the side effects was lactose intolerance. And I'm sitting against the wall in the back going, <laughs> Are you kidding me? Here my doctor's telling me to eat dairy because I'm osteoporosis, but I can't tolerate it. And with the program, the whole food plant-based, I went home and told my husband, get that stuff out of here, no more cheese, no more milk. He looks at me like I've lost my head. I switch to almond milk. I keep very little cheese in the house. I don't use milk for cooking. And I'm very slowly sagging into the whole food plant-based diet. 
Before I had my colon resection, I was 5'11", 160 pounds. I've shrunk a little bit. Um, I went now weigh out at about 135. And I have kept that for six years. Very good. So thank you. And thank you. Well, you've done great. Um, let me jump in on this calcium issue a little bit uh, because you raised it. And what you said is right. You know, so many doctors will say, if you have osteoporosis or if you're at risk, uh, dairy has calcium in it. But here's something really important to remember. Cows do not make calcium. Calcium is in the earth. And so when grass grows out of the ground, it carries calcium with it. The calcium goes into the roots and gets into the, the green part of the grass. So the cow eats the calcium that came out of the earth and, and got into the grass. And then some of that calcium ends up in the milk. And when you drink milk, what happens? First of all, you only absorb about a third of its calcium. The other two thirds just goes right through you. But the cow also adds lactose sugar to it, and that's what's upsetting your stomach. Um, what if you don't go that way at all? What if instead, there's calcium in the earth, broccoli grows out of the earth, and so does kale, and so do collards, and so do Brussels sprouts. Mm -hmm. And if you eat the green leafy vegetables directly, not the grass, hopefully, but the other <laughs> leafy vegetables, uh, you get the calcium from direct from the source, and the absorption is actually higher from green vegetables than it is from milk. And, and Brussels sprouts don't add any of that lactose, sugar, or the other things that are there to upset your stomach. So you've done the, you've done the right choice, congratulations. And if there is a little bit of cheese left in your refrigerator, tonight when you go home, just put it down the garbage disposal. <laughs> you don't want it to be there to tempt you, but anyway, you've done great. Thank you. Uh, did you have a question, sir? Yes. Uh, yes. Um, uh, I'm Ken Schmidt. Uh, actually, actually, this is a, I'm just going to tell you a personal uh, story. About a year and a half ago, I was diagnosed with prostate cancer in one of the little 12 areas that they do a little sample in. Uh, and so about a year ago, I was exposed to your book, The Cheese Trap. Uh, and I read that, and it was pretty scary uh, and in that it promotes the growth of especially fast-growing cells like cancer. Uh, so I stopped eating, I eat cheese a lot, I would sometimes eat it three times a day. Uh, cheese omelet for breakfast and a cheese sandwich for lunch and a casserole with cheese in it for supper. So I've given up all dairy, 99% because, you know, when you go out, sometimes it's hard to tell um, if it doesn't have the word cheese in the, in the menu. Um, so maybe 99 or 99.5% of I'm, I'm dairy free. And six months ago, I went back to the prostate doctor and he took samples from those 12 areas plus in the one area that had cancer before he took like five samples there and he said the cancer's gone mm. so and <laughs> i've also lost about 15 pounds due to that i was got, got very very encouraged because i lost uh, some some weight and i also have cut back a little bit elsewhere so i've lost about 20 pounds so far well, you've done great. So the only thing that, I, that, I'm, that I'm using now is, is uh, nutritional yeast in place of Parmesan. And the rest of the cheese flavors, I'm just not doing. Because, you know, if you, there's plenty of recipes that don't use cheese um, that taste good. Very good. That's fantastic. That's great. You know, um, thank you for sharing, sharing with us. Um, I'm not sure if the other members of the group have had a chance to talk much about cancer survival. but. Um, Dean Ornish, who did that fantastic work on reversing heart disease back in the 19, around 1990 and thereabouts, uh, then did a study in men who, it wasn't a heart study, it was a prostate cancer study. They were all men who had prostate cancer, slowly growing, so they didn't necessarily have to have surgery. But half of the men followed their usual diets, and the other half went on a completely vegan diet. No cheese, no meat, no, no nothing, uh, no animal products at all. And the blood test that they track is called PSA. I know you're familiar with this, and hopefully your doctor's track, tracking your PSA too. Um, in the control group, PSA was gradually rising a bit by bit by bit, um, which is what happens as, as cancer gradually progresses. And a few members of the control group had to drop out of the study because their PSAs were going up so much, they had to have surgery. Um, but in the vegan group in Dean Ornish's study, PSA on average was actually falling, meaning that their, their bodies were healing. 
And during the year-long study, there wasn't anybody who had to stop and have uh, any kind of treatment. Now, the body is a fragile thing, and it's relatively easy to get cancer, I'm sorry to say, and no matter what we do, it can happen. But on the other hand, it, when we follow a really healthy plant-based diet and you eliminate the animal products, it just, it just takes that foot off the gas pedal and says instead of driving that cancer forward with unhealthy foods, we're just going to stop that process and let the body heal. So congratulations on what you have done. It's really so terrific. My, my experience goes along with that um, uh, study also. My PSA had gone up to like 5.8 or something like that. It's now down to about 3.7. Okay. So. That's it. That, exactly. Okay. All right. Stick with your doctor, um, but you but uh, charge your doctor for the advice that you give him. <laughs> <laughs> I like that. Be, because because, <laughs> because you know doctors should be. It's not as if this research was 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 not published in peer-reviewed journals. And so whatever other treatments a patient might have. You, you're going to be eating breakfast, lunch, and dinner. We should pick the foods that help our body to fight cancer, to fight heart disease, to fight diabetes, and fight these other things. And if you bring the food into it, um, you need a whole lot less of the other stuff. So congratulations. You've, you've really you. done fantastic. Thank you. Uh, good morning. I'm Sarah Lee. I'm a quick question. What do you think about dairy-free cheese that's made with tofu? This is one my husband because he can't seem to give up cheese, but he he likes that. He eats that. So, so it's it's cheese made from tofu. Yeah, you you can buy them in all the grocery stores. Even Walmart sells them. And yeah. Slices. Yeah. 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 There are, there are vegan cheeses out out there now. Um, there are, there is one called Kite Hill that it's exactly the cheese making process uh, with the cultures and everything, but they start. Not with cow's milk, but with almond milk, um, which is nice because there aren't any hormones in the almonds. Um, and there are others made from cashews and so forth. I kind of think of them as if you're a, a cheese addict, the, the vegan cheeses are sort of your cheese methadone. That they, <laughs> they, they help you to, to kind of break free from the addiction. Um, the reason I put it that way is uh, take a look at the label. They, they are definitely, they are always better than the dairy cheeses that they replace. Even so, some of them are almost as fatty as the original. They don't have cholesterol in it, but they still have some fat. So you might um, have them be kind of your nibbling special occasion food as opposed to your go-to everyday food. And eventually you might find that you go beyond them. Um, and and, the, and the, the previous uh, man was just talking about using nutritional yeast. Fantastic on pizzas and um, in casseroles, even in soups and, and on vegetables. So um, when you tra transition to these sort of zero fat kinds of foods, you get an extra payout. Okay. But but I think I think as a transition, the vegan cheeses are really really a good choice. Okay. That was an interesting question because yesterday I read an article on the internet that soy products were the very worst things you could put in your body. That's not my question though. Um, my question is, I have a granddaughter who has type 1 diabetes. It was, she just had, she had a baby two years ago, and boom. She was a vegan uh, as a teenager, became very ill, and then became a vegetarian. I, I believe she eats extremely healthy food, but I want her to know, is it possible to reverse type 1 diabetes with Diet modification. Okay. Um, by the way, let's come back to that soy question because I, I don't know if your group has had a chance to talk about that. If not, we should. Um, but about type 1 diabetes, um, as everybody knows, type 2 is the really common one. It often comes from adding extra weight and so forth. Um, and that, the type 2 can go away completely and it improves dramatically with a vegan diet. But type 1, if, if she really does have type 1, that's where the insulin producing cells that are in the pancreas have stopped making insulin. They just don't make it anymore. And so it's not possible to get rid of type 1. It won't go away completely. However, uh, a low fat, completely vegan diet is still what you want to do, both for type 2 and for type 1. And the reason is 
first of all, number one, um, when people with type 1 go on a vegan diet, for some reason, their insulin requirement goes way down. Is she on insulin, by the way? Mm -hmm. Yes. Okay, all right. So her need for insulin is likely to drop. The second thing that happens uh, is that it protects your blood vessels. And this is really important because with diabetes, it's really not the high blood sugar that kills you for the most part. It's the assault to the blood vessels, the blood vessels of the heart, the blood vessels of the eyes or of the kidneys or of the extremities. And so you don't want any cholesterol in your diet at all. You don't want any animal fat in your diet. You want your blood vessels to be really healthy. So a low fat vegan diet allows a person who has type one diabetes, even though they'll continue to make insulin because their pancreas isn't making it anymore, but it allows them to live a normal life. And so I would still recommend it for, for that reason. Mm -hmm. Well, she's an organic farmer. She's very slim. She, uh, I think, is a very healthy eater. She has gone back to eating eggs and perhaps cheese. I don't know about that. But uh, you know, we worry about her as grandparents because she's only 30 years old. And well, this is well, going to be with her. This is going to be her life, I guess. Well, well, she she can do she can do great, um, but I would recommend I would strongly recommend a completely plant based diet because most people with type one diabetes and most people with type two diabetes die a cardiovascular death. Now, I don't want to frighten you or her, but half of Americans have a heart attack. That's what kills them. Um, for people with diabetes, it occurs much earlier. They lose a decade or more of life. And along the way, their vision and kidney functions are all compromised. So you want to protect those. And that's why, for me as a doctor and for other knowledgeable doctors, we do everything we can to protect the blood vessels. And if we learned anything in medicine in the last 30 years, it's animal product. Have the animal fat and the cholesterol that harms your blood vessels. So you don't want any of that stuff. Um, let me come back to the soy issue that you raised. Um, did this group have a chance to talk about soy? Have you heard about this, the, the issues and the controversy? I, was, I just happened to read this uh, uh, on, a, on a post yesterday, and there were three things that they said you absolutely should not ever, ever eat. And the first one was soy. The second one was wheatgrass. I don't know why anybody would eat wheatgrass. <laughs> and the other thing was uh, some kind of berry, a kind of beet berry or something. Like that. Okay. Okay. And All right. said, don't ever eat, you know, that's really, really bad. Okay. Um, I don't brought, to, that. brought to you brought to you by America's dairy farmers. Um, <laughs> yeah. let, let's tackle the soy thing because this is really, really important. And and if you haven't been paying attention to anything else, please please notice this one. Um, because you will read paranoid uh, articles on the web uh, raising an alarm about soybeans. And they're saying don't have soy milk or don't have tofu and so forth. And here's what they're getting at. Uh, back in, I believe it was 1931 or thereabouts, uh, researchers found that soybeans have compounds, natural compounds called isoflavones. And if you look at the chemical structure of isoflavones, you draw it on a blackboard, it looks a little bit like estrogen, uh, female sex hormones. Um, however, uh, well, th that led people to think, okay, what if a man consumes soybeans? Maybe he'll become effeminate. Uh, or maybe he'll become infertile uh, because if isoflavones are like a female sex hormone, this could hurt him. Um, well, it turned out that they don't. Um, in fact, you can look around Asia, in China or Japan, where people consume a lot of soy, there is no problem with male fertility at all. It's, I mean, if anything, they have a lot more fertility. But then the second thing was they said, well, if women consume soy, maybe their breast cancer risk would go up, and that's probably what you're reading in the article. Um, or if you had cancer already, um, it would make it uh, advance. So researchers have had a chance to look at that. And what they found blew everybody away. It turns out that the women who consume the most soy milk, the most uh, tofu, or other soy products, the women who consume the most of these, have about a 30 to 40% reduction in their risk of breast cancer. Secondly, women who have been previously diagnosed with breast cancer, the women who consume the most soy have, again, about a 30% reduced likelihood of dying of their cancer. So it, it turned out to be exactly the opposite. 
that soy reduces the likelihood of getting cancer and also reduces the likelihood of dying of it for people who have it already. Now, let me be clear. I'm not pushing soy. You don't have to have it. Um, it's totally optional. Um, although it's convenient, you can make soy into soy milk and soy cheese and soy bacon and one day they'll make snow tires out of it probably. Um, <laughs> it's, it's amazing. Um, but you, you, it, so it's very convenient. It's always better than whatever it replaced. But it's totally optional. But it does not cause cancer. It helps prevent cancer. It helps prevent. It, it helps promote cancer survival. Thank you. Well, having been a survivor myself, I'm glad I didn't throw the veggie burgers out of the fridge yesterday. <laughs> <laughs> Good. Anyway, that's a great question. Thank you for raising that. Do we have uh, another question? Yeah. Hello. Uh, thank you for Hi. being here for us. Um, I, if, I have two parts to my question. One, I'd like to hear more about the asthma and reducing cheese and dairy products from your food. My son has asthma, and he's been he's been plant-based, whole foods, but he still eats cheese and dairy products, so, somewhat. Uh, so, uh, and, and he has asthma really bad. So I just want to hear more about that. And the other thing is, um, being on a uh, plant-based, whole food diet, uh, you need B12. And I, we have a daughter that is uh, lacking in B12, but she, the normal B12 su supplements don't, don't uh, she doesn't absorb them. So I thought you, maybe you could comment on what you do okay. for B12. Um, let's, let's talk about it first. Um, how do you, why do you say she doesn't absorb them? Well, she's, she's uh, low in B12 and doesn't, uh, the doctor's saying that she doesn't uh, absorb them well. Okay, um, almost everybody absorbs them fine, and it's um, it may be a question of dosage. Um, if for whatever reason she's low, um, you go to the store and you get a dose that's a thousand, you know, a thousand micrograms or 1,500 micrograms, sometimes more, and you just take it every day, and, and she should take it every day, and then you just get retested. Um, it's, it's rare, there are very rare cases where people, no matter what their diet is like, they just can't absorb B12, and those people need a once a month injection. Uh, but that's quite rare, and even most of those, uh, if you put them on a high enough oral dose, they absorb it. So anyway, you're doing the right thing. Work with your doctor on that. Um, now tell me about your son. Um, he's had, how old is he now? He is 37. And 37. He's been on, okay. you know, he eats really well. He's a yoga instructor very uh, physically fit uh, and just and, and he just can't asthma. shake the asthma at all I mean it's just okay and does, does he need an inhaler or medication yes. Oral medication? yes uh, he does he does does it in, does it uh, impair his ability to do sports um, well it would if he was doing sports at this time but he's not but okay so he can't go out for a good run or, or something like that um, does he have allergies, seasonal allergies, or pet allergies, or something yeah, like that? Pet, pet all, all of the above. You know, uh, tree pollen, uh, dogs. Uh, all right. Saliva, okay. Um, all right. He, he's saliva. really lucky. He's really lucky. He has you for a dad. Has he ever gone with no animal products at all, no dairy whatsoever? I don't. I don't think so. I know he's went. You know, uh, vegetarian for a long time, and. Uh, but he, okay. but he still eats some cheese and dairy, so. Is, is he with you in the room? No, he's not. All right. <laughs> but I can um, call him as soon as, as soon as we're done, um, give him a copy of the cheese trap if you haven't already, okay. and encourage him not to give up any skepticism. He can, he can think, I don't know if this will work or not. But what he should do is get away from dairy completely and do it for the next four to six months, not one drop of okay. milk or cheese or anything like that, and, and let me explain why. You've heard of kids who have a peanut allergy, right? Mm -hmm. They get a little bit of peanuts in their, in, the, in their meal, and their body reacts to the proteins in the peanut, and it causes this tremendous inflammation uh, in them that could be harmful. Now, his inflammation isn't that strong, and it's not to peanuts. It could be to the dairy protein. Now, this isn't true for everybody, but it, but it is true, it is so common, that, and, and in the cheese trap, I tell the story of, of Chad Sarno, who was a young man uh, living in New Hampshire who had pet allergies, seasonal allergies, and terrible asthma. 
Um, he was athletic, but he couldn't get through a game because his asthma would kick in. And he had to go in and out of the emergency room, he's on inhalers, everything like that. Um, he did exactly what I'm telling you to suggest to your son. No animal products at all, because if you take the dairy protein out of the diet, the body no longer reacts against that protein. The protein in the milk goes into the blood. Your body recognizes that it's a foreign protein and makes antibodies to it. Those antibodies end up attacking the lungs and causing his asthma. And it also sets him up for worse allergies to pets, to seasonal pollen, you know, pollen and stuff like that. Um, and but so when Chad went on a completely vegan diet with no dairy at all, his asthma didn't just get better, it completely vanished. But it took about four months for it to go away. The body chemistry has to kind of get back to normal. Now, not only does he not have asthma, and he doesn't use his inhaler, he doesn't have any pet allergies anymore. He's got a dog now. Um, and he uh, doesn't have seasonal allergies. It's it changes his life. And I have on staff here people who have done exactly the same thing. So he can continue to live this way if he wants to with his medicines and stuff. But if I, if I were him, the next four to six months, zero dairy, treat it like an allergy, because that's what it may be, um, and see if he can get rid of his asthma, and it will just change his life. And let me know what happens if you would. Um, but, but you cannot do this in moderation. It's like, how much poison ivy do you want? You can't have any. Um, if he's sensitive to dairy, he can't have any. And But he doesn't have to give up his skepticism. Just try it, see if it works, but the only way to know is to avoid it 100% and give yourself some time to adjust. Okay. Thank you, Zara. Good luck. He's lucky to have you as, as dad. Yeah. Hi, Dr. Bernard. Kim Kirshner. How are you? I'm one of your Food for Life instructors. And I'm here. Oh, hooray. Thank you. <laughs> Next week, we are actually holding a Food for Life series, um, four week series. So I'm here to promote that and say hello to you. Uh, two things. I wonder if you would talk to them a little bit about vitamin D. And also, um, maybe a little bit of historical, um, you've been around a long time, you've started a lot of great programs, including our Food for Life program and the Cancer Project, PCRM, maybe a little bit of history on that. Thank you. Okay, well, first of all, thank you for working with us on Food for Life. For people who are not familiar, um, Food for Life is a great program where people can take classes. Uh, they learn about nutrition, they also learn about um, cooking. And it just makes all of these transitions so easy. So, so do share your contact information with everybody so that they and their and their reluctant spouses and family members can all join your class. Um, uh, okay. So vitamin D. If if I'm not going in the right direction on this, you let me know. Uh, vitamin D is something you need for healthy bones because vitamin D has a job to help your body to absorb the calcium that's in the foods that you eat. So if you're eating broccoli, it's got calcium. Uh, vitamin D escorts that into the blood. It's also a cancer preventer. It reduces the risk of cancer. And vitamin D actually normally comes from the sun. So, if you're outside for 20 minutes and your arms and your face are open to the sun and you're not wearing a sunscreen, um, the sunlight on the skin starts making vitamin D and that's really what you need. However, um, if you, like me, grew up in Fargo, North Dakota, or if it's a really cold day outside, you may not be getting that sunlight. Um, if you're not getting sun, then you should take a supplement. Um, and, uh, uh, and this is true regardless of what your diet is like. If you're not getting sun, you need a vitamin D supplement. And uh, most people would say that a supplement of up to 2,000 international units a day is healthy and safe. Um, if, on the other hand, you live in the tropics and you're outside every day getting sunlight, that's all the vitamin D you need. Uh, regarding history, I'll just say a couple words. Um, uh, the, the Physicians Committee for Responsible Medicine got started in 1985. We have um, a lot of nutrition programs, a lot of nutrition uh, educational materials on our, on, on our website, pcrm.org. Um, and we do clinical trials. Uh, we do a lot of work to make research more ethical. And we have, a, oh, a thousand and some recipes. We have an annual conference for physicians. This next one is August 10th and 11th here in Washington, D.C. And we do lots of other things. So I hope you'll visit our website, pcrm.org, and, and I hope you'll join us. Thank you. All right, uh, let me take another question. Hello, my name is Lynn. 
I have a three-part question, and none of them are related. Uh -oh. <laughs> um, All right, well, let's take them one at a time okay. and see what we do. <laughs> so the first one is um, nutritional yeast, and I never heard of it until I've been coming to the Chat and Chew um, programs. My husband is allergic to yeast, um, loves cheese. Um, so almost every recipe I look at says nutritional yeast. So I'm not really sure what to do about that as far as getting that flavor. Um, I didn't know if you had any suggestions on that. Um, it's really just a question of how his allergy manifests and how serious it is. If it's not too serious um, and he wants to test it, he can see. Um, and as I was saying earlier, for some reason when people get away from cow's milk, other allergies go away or improve, and I don't really know why that is. It's not that they're allergic to the milk necessarily, but when they get away from dairy, other allergies do seem to diminish. So that would be worth trying. But if, if his allergy is really quite severe uh, to other yeasts, um, then he might want to not go in the new nutritional yeast direction. Um, it's totally optional. It's just a flavor. So if you want a yeasty or a cheesy kind of flavor, people use nutritional yeast for that purpose. But if he's allergic to yeast, he may decide he doesn't want to bother with it. Yeah, because we've had um, blood tests. Um, we've gone to functional medicine doctors, and they do that series of blood tests, and he tested very high on yeast. So. Oh, OK. All, all right. Um, if, if he, the tests, the tests like that um, are sometimes helpful indicators, but sometimes they identify something, um, but it's not really too serious of a, of a problem. So in, in other words, what you're concerned about is, is if he has an allergy and he had yeast and he went into anaphylactic shock and had to go to the emergency room, um, then you don't want to ever try that again. Um, that's what we're talking about with peanut allergies. But if it's not like that, if it was just a blood test suggested that he's sensitive to it, then I wouldn't worry about it so much. He could try it if he wants. Okay. Uh, the other question that I had is I like to go out to dinner, breakfast, and so forth, and every time I order a cup of coffee, there's no other choice except those little moo moo creams or whole milk. And so I take a little bit of milk. And so if you're saying eliminate all dairy, um, that means eliminating coffee because I can't drink it black. So what do you? Um, a couple of choices. There are many vegan coffee creamers out there now. Some people use ordinary soy milk, but sometimes it doesn't mix quite as well with the coffee. And there are almond milk and a million, a million others. And Silk makes a coffee creamer that's specifically designed for it, and they make it in different flavors. So try, you know, try different ones and see which one you like, um, and then you can bring it with you if you want to, or you can drink it black, or you can do what I did and just say coffee isn't really enriching my life, um, and you know, if you want to have coffee, it's fine. Coffee will not hurt you. It's the things that go into it, as you right. said, that can, can be the problem. But um, just an observation: okay. eight-year-old kids have so much energy. And they, they feel great and they sleep like they're comatose. Mm -hmm. And they never wake up in the morning and say, give me my cup of coffee. Um, so it, it, as adults, because of our stress uh, in our lives, and we may not be sleeping very well, and then we get kind of done coffee, and then we feel we can't live without it. But when I talk to people who've actually broken away from coffee, they kind of go back to that eight-year-old self where their energy is actually better than when you get off the caffeine roller coaster, and their sleep is better. Um, but because that sounds totally unthinkable, um, and I'm not going to necessarily suggest it other than to plant that little seed. So in the same way, six and eight-year-old kids don't need a beer to unwind at the end of the day, and they don't need coffee to get them going. Their, their natural biology makes them better than, than their parents ever are going to feel. Um, you might want to consider reclaiming that. But in the meanwhile, there are soy creamers and you might try them out. And you know, and I did that. I quit coffee one time completely and I felt great in the morning. Better now than I ever did. Yeah. You know, better without the coffee. All right, right. so my other question is chronic fatigue. Uh, no matter what I eat, no matter what I eliminate from my diet, no matter what I do, vegan, whatever. I'm exhausted all the time. I struggle with that. So 
So I wanted to know what you what your thoughts were on chronic fatigue and diet. Okay. Um, first, first of all, I'm sorry to hear that you have to deal with that. Um, that can really be a challenge, and it can also be diagnostically frustrating because you go to see the doctor, and the doctor says, "I don't, I don't know what's the matter," and, and it, it can really feel very unrewarding. Um, so I don't have a magic answer, but I have some principles that we follow in cases like that. Um, one is to do what you already done, which is to look, are there things that affect energy and that lead to fatigue? And so if caffeine withdrawal is part of it, we just try to get as clean as we can and, and make sure that people are sleeping. Um, winning the lottery is very good for this as well. So have you quit your job? And I am retired? not working. I, I'm in the best position I've ever been in my life. I really don't have any stressors yeah, right okay. now, um, except my husband. And then, <laughs> <laughs> and, and then you do, of course, want to, to talk with the doctor to, to rule out a whole bunch of things, and the doctor is, is going to go through a list of things that you may have already gone through, like, how is your thyroid? Mm -hmm. And it could be depression, it could be this, could be that. Um, is, are you anemic? And most people aren't, aren't anemic or any of those things. Mm -hmm. um, so you just kind of go down that list, and you just try to see which it is. And then uh, beyond that, you just try, then, then what people will do is do, um, the cleanest lifestyle they possibly can, which is uh, a low-fat, completely vegan diet, and then they also make sure that they build some regular exercise into their into their lifestyle as much as they can do, and especially if they don't feel like, it. Um, because they say, oh, I don't have any, any energy. So you say, okay, three times a week, go out for a 10-minute brisk walk. Okay, that I can do. And then after a week, and for three times a week, uh, then the next week, do it 15 minutes. And then 20 and then 25. And as you work up your energy, what, what typically happens is sleep becomes deeper and more intense because your exercising body demands sleep later. And for whatever that fatigue was, it just kind of gradually melts away. But none of that's going to happen if you have an untreated anemia, an untreated hypothyroid condition, or something else like that. All right, thank you. All right, so that's not a complete answer, but I wish oh. you luck in, in, in the detective work that you're doing now to, to nail it down. All right, thank you. All right, thank you for your question. Thank you. In Power Foods uh, for the Brain, you mentioned Alzheimer's and aluminum. You also yes. mentioned things like zinc and copper. Could you kind of elaborate on, on those? Yeah. Thank you. Um, in my book, Power Foods for the Brain, that came out a couple of years ago, I, the reason I wrote it is I was personally astounded to read uh, very recent research studies that are, are the maturation of, of de many, many years of research, decades of research, uh, that have been following people and, and showing who tends to get Alzheimer's and who doesn't. And certain dietary patterns have emerged. and your average person has no idea about it. So I wrote Power Foods for the Brain to say, here are the foods that seem to preserve brain function, and here are the ones that threaten it. And so the big bad actors, luckily, were the ones things you want to avoid anyway. Um, saturated fat, which is in dairy, is the number one source of that, meat is number two. Um, that is a big promoter of Alzheimer's disease. Trans fats also are a big source. But you mentioned the, the metals. Um, copper. Uh, I talked about a number of them in that book, but the ones to really focus on are aluminum, copper, and iron. And all of them are controversial, especially aluminum. But some research does show that if aluminum, like an aluminum pan, if the food touches the aluminum surface of the pan, it can absorb some of that aluminum. Aluminum is a neurotoxin. And in places where they have a lot of aluminum exposure, they have a lot more Alzheimer's disease. So in that book, I describe where you get aluminum, and it can be in drinking water, it can be in antacids like maalox, that's magnesium and aluminum hydroxide. Maalox is you're just drinking aluminum. Um, it can be in a number of other things, but you can avoid it. Now, there are good doctors who say, I don't think aluminum matters at all. Fine, uh, but you don't need it, so avoiding it is totally harmless, and I encourage people to avoid it. Uh, copper, if you've got copper pipes, or um, copper cookware where the copper touches the food. Um, uh, some animal products are high in copper as well. And multiple vitamins, while you do need the B12, 
Many of them add copper, and you'll see it right on the, the label that they add copper or they add iron, sometimes heroic amounts, and you shouldn't be taking those. You should get just the B12, don't get the copper, and then iron, if you use a, a how many people in this room have a cast iron pan? How many people have a cast iron pan? Okay, if you're using it every day, that's too much. If it's your once a, once a month thing, it's not, a, not an issue. But um, if the iron is in touch with your food, the iron gets into the, the food, and you need a little bit of iron for good health, but you don't need, you're getting an overdose from your pan. So anyway, um, that's the, the deal. Um, I encourage people to look where these metals are, avoid them to the extent we can, and let's see if we can reduce the risk of Alzheimer's disease. You kind of answered my second real quick question, and that is on the multivitamin. Um, if, if you're eating a, a solid vegan diet, uh, do you think that's necessary? And if, and if it is, should you look for a product that doesn't have the, the zinc and the copper and the magnesium? Yes, yeah. Um, uh, what you need is vitamin B12. And so, and, and vitamin D if you're not getting some. So in the past, I used to say a multiple vitamin is a pretty good source of both of them. It's really convenient and nobody's, you know, nobody's reluctant to take a multiple vitamin, so I used to promote that. But then when we started to realize that copper and iron contribute to Alzheimer's risk, at least that's what the studies are showing, I started to think, wait a minute, if you're gonna take a multiple vitamin, get one of the ones that is free of iron and free of copper, and, and you'll see them. Um, if you go online, and sometimes you'll see it in the health food store. They're, it's called vitamins only. Um, and so take that instead of the multiple vitamin that has all the stuff in it. Thank you very much. Sure, thank you. Great question. Hello. Hi, doctor. Uh, my question is, I have noticed that my blood pressure is going up. And I usually have low blood pressure. And uh, I eat a plant-based diet. And I don't take any medication, but, um, well, really no, but it's my, my sister-in-law, the nurse, tells me that it's because I'm getting older and that my blood pressure will automatically go up. So, no. <laughs> um, so it, your question is, what can I do to get my blood pressure back down? Yes, that's it. Um, do you remember what your blood pressure was? Um, it's generally below 120 over 60, and the other day it was 130 over 80. Oh, I'm sorry? That, that seems high to me. Um, there are other people in the room who would like to buy your appointment. <laughs> <laughs> I think so. <laughs> <laughs> um, what I, what I would suggest you do is, um, well, first of all, the, the prescription remains the same, that you want to have a totally vegan diet, no animal products at all, right. because animal products, not that you would do this, but let's say as, as an example, I have a chicken salad sandwich for lunch, and it's made with chicken salad and mayo, and I put some lettuce and tomato on top, and I eat it. The, the fat particles from the chicken fat and from the mayo, the fat particles go into the blood, and now my blood is getting thicker. It's more viscous, it's, it's thicker. And so to push it, the heart has to kind of push harder and the artery walls get more stiff from that, the fat that I just ate. And so blood pressure goes up. And so when people follow a 100% vegan diet, their blood pressure is always a little bit lower. The second thing is that animal products tend to have sodium, especially cheese. So all you people who haven't gotten rid of the cheese, this is another reason to get away from it. It's, it's very high in sodium. Look at the label, you see what I'm talking about. Um, sodium raises your blood pressure, but vegetables have potassium instead of sodium. The potassium lowers your blood pressure. Um, so all those things will, will help you. Um, and if you happen at, at some point to have a reading that was a little higher than normal, I wouldn't do anything if it's not astronomical, but I, I, I mean, 130 over 80 is, Nothing for me. I, know. Um, I thought that was fine. What, what I would do is just follow it. Um, make sure it's you and not the monitor, because the monitors get a little funny every now and then. Um, go, you can go to your doctor's office and have it checked there. Um, but, um, but, but here's the other thing. Don't, when you check your blood pressure, sit down, relax, wait for a couple minutes, and then check it. I, and check it like in the morning, you know, when you just get up. That's when it's really going to be low. 
don't do not run in, take your blood pressure at sea because it's gonna you could be 10, 20 points higher just from movement or laughing or talking, all those things will, will raise it up too. And then and that will give you an artificial or artificial reading. Okay. Thank you very much. All right, good luck to you. Hi, Dr. Barnard. Can you Hello. see me? Mary Litton. Oh, Mary, how are you? Hi. <laughs> That's not that my name now, but that, I just had to come and say hi. We were 18. I know. Anyway, I know that, and so um, I tried to get on the vegan cruise. I tried to win a free one, but I didn't do it. Um, but And thank you for the autographed uh, book. I, Nanette and uh, Julie got me, your, that you autographed the cheese trap for me, so I appreciate that. Is your house still there on 9th Street? Yep. <laughs> it is. But I live in Florida now, so it's good to see you. You look great. Oh, uh, likewise. Right back at you. Where do you live in Florida now? Winter Haven. Oh, you smart person. I so know. Good. What am I doing up here in Washington, D.C.? It's cold up here. I know. Yeah. Yeah. So I just wanted to say hi. I'm, I'm vegan as well now, so I don't have a question, but I've enjoyed hearing everybody's oh. questions. So. Well, that's so great. Mary and I went to, to, uh, to school at Hawthorne Elementary School and then to, to South High. And there's a lot of pre-vegans there, so people who, who need uh, your encouragement. So uh, if, we, if we do that, I think our whole graduating class is going to live longer. I agree. I do have one um, observation. It's very difficult to go out to eat when you are a vegan, especially, I don't know if you guys um, have experienced it, but in this area, there aren't a lot of choices, and when I say I'm plant-based or I say I'm vegan, they just look at you like there's nothing on the menu. So you really have to be, um, not push the issue, but you just have to get it out there so that people are more aware and restaurants are more aware. I don't know, you live in a place that I'm sure there's a lot of choices, we don't have that. So. Yeah. Oh, great. yeah, Mary, that's a great question. Um, Here's what I, I suggest people think about. And every community is a little bit different, but in general, when I'm traveling um, or wherever I am, I always kind of, the way I put it is think international. Like there's, a, there's an Italian place. And the Italian place, well, no matter what they serve, they can always make angel hair pasta with a marinara sauce or an arrabbiata sauce, which happens to be vegan, even though they don't use that word. Um, and you just have to ask them to, you know, when they come over with all the Parmesan cheese and they want to make a blizzard of cheese on one of them, they, you know, don't do that. Um, and then they're also often a little overly exuberant with a bottle of oil. Mm -hmm. You might want to have them kind of keep using it too. But the Italian places, they'll bring out bruschetta and lots of salads, and then the pasta with the arrabbiata or marinara sauce. They'll grill vegetables for you. Um, and, and when we're thinking international, I also then think about Chinese uh, places. Uh, they have many, many tofu dishes, vegetable dishes, rice dishes, noodle dishes. Um, Mexican, most of them don't use lard in their beans anymore. Some of them do, but mostly don't. So you, you can get um, veggie fajitas, bean burritos, a bean taco. Uh, extra points for Japanese, if there's a sushi bar, um, don't get the fish sushi, but they'll make a cucumber roll or avocado roll or whatever, and along with salads and soups, and it's often the most delicate kind of, of cuisines. Uh, if you're at Subway, yeah. This is not necessarily elegant, but they'll make you a sandwich with lettuce and tomato and cucumbers and spinach and olives and a uh, little red wine vinegar and they'll toast it for you. And if you're a Taco Bell, it's not the pinnacle of culinary art, but they'll give you a bean burrito, all the cheese. So if we kind of think on, I think of it as international cuisine, Italian, Mexican, Chinese, whatever, um, that's where the, the choices tend to blossom a little bit more. So hopefully that's helpful. It is very helpful. I think we just have to be more outspoken when we go to these restaurants and just say there's got to be something on this menu and don't give up. You know, there are people that just say, I can't eat here. Well, we should be able to eat wherever, you know, we go. So anyway, oh. thank you. Hey, oh. hey, wait, before, before you go here, um, you know, you just said something and I, I want to plant this seed with you for just for just a second. If you, I'm going to get political for just a minute. If we got, if we got it in a second. This was um, just a thank you and so we're fine. <laughs> okay, great. Um, Mary, I just want to share this with you. Um, it has occurred to me, why is it that if you're on, let's say you're on a plane, let's say you're going overseas, and uh, you take off and then the flight attendant comes by and says, okay, do you want the beef or the chicken, the beef or the chicken? And you say, well, how about do you have a vegetarian meal? No, you should have ordered that 48 hours in advance. Oh, right. oh gee, what's that about? Um, or a kid's in school 
and the kid, in, the child in school has uh, doesn't want to have dairy. Uh, maybe he's lactose intolerant. No, you got to bring a note from your doctor. My thought is, wait a minute. What if you took all the people who have certain dietary needs and you had a set of meals that, that helped everybody? Here's what I mean. Let's say on your plane to Europe, there's one person who's from the Hindu extraction. He doesn't want beef. Somebody else is Muslim. Well, they don't want pork. Uh, somebody else is observant uh, from a Jewish tradition. They don't want pork or shellfish. You take all those things out. And there's a few people who are vegetarian or vegan. Well, let's take all the animal products out. Um, we could have what I'm going to call universal meals. Yes. And in the same way as your menu <coughs> might have little red hearts by all the vegan meals, why is it that every airliner, every restaurant couldn't have universal meals? Mm -hmm. So at my Italian place, it's my angel hair pasta arrabbiata, and it happens to be a universal meal. So if you're a vegan or you're a Muslim or whatever, you don't have to ask. It's there mm -hmm. um, on my airline. Uh, it's, let's say you've got my fancy ravioli that happens to be vegan, and I can call it a universal meal. So I'm developing this concept, and sooner or later, I'm going to push this uh, to the airlines and the airline clubs and schools and everywhere so that you don't have to ask and you don't have to apologize. They just will know that these are the guidelines that work for everybody and keep us all healthy. Mm -hmm. Sounds great. Just thank you, Mary. Thank you. That was a wonderful thing from the time today. We thank you so much. And uh, we're going to give your medical center this subscription to the new authentic kind and enlightening diet. And of course, you know you are featured on that page. Oh, look at that. So we're going to send you, we told them earlier when I introduced you with your bio that you are a physician and a musician. And so this will be on its way to you. And I already have your CD that you gave me last year on the cruise. I bought it, of course. You signed it. And, <laughs> and Karen and I will be at Sublime and on the cruise. And we look forward to listening to you and our other physicians again. And we thank everybody. Oh, that's coming out in two weeks. Thank you. That's yes. really great. so much for being here with us today and I think we've you've answered all our questions unless you have something that you want to finish with we're good well I I do I saw somebody came up and it looked like she had a question I, and yep. did she want to come back up and ask her question I think I think it was Karen she came up with uh, with Nana she just came to say we'll see you I do have a week. question though oh, okay we do have one more question quickly. okay great I had high cholesterol and started taking an oral chelator, EDTA product, and taking that about an eighth of a teaspoon in the morning and then a multi-mineral at night. Are you in favor of that for lowering cholesterol? Um, I would, well, first of all, I'm, I'm glad that you're paying attention to your cholesterol. I wouldn't start there. Um, the where I would start with is what causes cholesterol to go up. And your body makes, is making cholesterol it makes it because it uses it in cell membranes and it uses it to make hormones. Cholesterol is a raw material that your body makes for a lot of purposes. But what causes your body to make too much are animal products, the fat that it, that's in them, the saturated fat in animal products stimulates your body to, to make too much cholesterol. And that's the big problem. So when we recognize that, we take all the animal products out of our diet to a totally vegan diet and do that for about two, three months. And you go to the doctor, and what you start to see is your cholesterol is coming down. And then with it, as, as that's coming down, everything else gets better. Our weight gets better, our blood sugar and our blood pressure, they all tend to go to go in the same same direction. My cholesterol was 80% good, 20% bad. So the doctor says, well, this is really good ratio, but still it's too high. Yep, and, and yes, you, you know, your doctor is, is um, it has your best interest at heart. But um, what you want to do is, is get that cholesterol down. And the method that I described is the way to do it. Now, if it sounds like a big thing, like, do I really want to go vegan? Focus on the short term and say, let me try this as an experiment. I'm going to do this for two months or so. And so you don't give up skepticism and, and you don't give up any food forever. You just do it for a couple months. And what you'll see is that the benefits really come. And then you can decide if you want to stick with it. Will the EDTA speed that process up as well? I wouldn't go there. Um, I, 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 uh, it's in the same, it, for 90% of people, the food choices that they are making cause the problem, cause the cholesterol problem. So what we want to do is stop the cause rather than try to 
take it away with pharmaceuticals or with supplements. Okay. Do you recommend eating bread on a vegan diet? If you want to, you can have you can have bread. It's really a question of what goes between the bread. <laughs> you know what I'm talking about? Thank you. Thank you very much for your time. We've been an hour now, and I think we'll let you get back to work. Thank you. Thank you very much.